Good morning. My name is David Barger, and I'll be reading today from the, uh, the New International Version from Ruth 4, 2 through 10. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I can't do it. Now in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have brought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today, you are witnesses. This is the word of the Lord. That was a long verse. Thank you for reading it so well. Please bow with me for prayer. Father, with the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I'm happy and sad. I'm sad because we're, we're almost wrapped up with Ruth. And I really like Ruth. It's like that romantic story in the back of the Bible. And I really like it. Now, I'm happy because, one, I get to talk about the Kinsman Redeemer, which I'm excited about. And next week, we're moving on to a series on Abraham, and I'm excited about that as well. But I kind of wanted to just start with recapping where we've been. This week, we're talking about the Kinsman Redeemer. Last week, we talked about love. We talked about Boaz and Ruth on the threshing floor. It was all romantic. It was dust. There was wheat in the air. That doesn't really make sense, does it? No. But anyway, he put his shawl on her, and that says, I'm going to marry you. It's very sweet. They, they could totally make a movie out of that whole scene. Two weeks ago, we talked about how Boaz was so hospitable to Ruth uh, that when they were um, basically you know, cutting down stalks and harvesting, that he was, uh, had his people pull out uh, wheat stalks, nothing is as romantic as wheat stalks, you know. There's roses and wheat stalks to just give to people. Um, and he was so great to actually take care of her and provide for her. And we talked about hospitality, how it shares, how it sacrifices, uh, how it preserves dignity. And then, of course, three weeks ago, Pastor Lupina spoke to you about the beginning of Ruth and how. Ruth had this amazing uh, discipleship summary where he says, I will go where you go, and your God will be my God. Now, my understanding is that she also kind of gave you some, some background uh, about the book of Ruth as a whole. I kind of wanted to recap that as well, because the, the book of Ruth as a whole, people kind of disagree on what it's about. Now, some believe that it's an origin story. It's, a, it's an origin story for the Davidic dynasty. Uh, it was common in the Middle East at that time uh, for a king, especially a new king, 
uh, they would kind of tell his story in a way that seemed to make him more than anything else. That he was uh, descended from an ancient royal line, or his great 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 grandparents invented something amazing, or something like that. There's this this concept of well, they, he's always been royalty. He's just now coming in. To power. An origin story is what happened. And this actually, the book of Ruth, was written at the time of King David's reign. So it can seem a lot like that. But I, I kind of have an exception to that. Because if we were talking about David's origin and how noble and amazing it was, they wouldn't have included and even highlighted that Ruth, his great grandmother, was a Moabite. Because if you remember from three weeks ago, Pastor Lupin told you about the history between Israel and Moabite, and it is a jagged one. We know that Moab is a son of Lot born into an adulterous relationship. And we know that Moab and Israel, when they returned from exile, were mm, not friends. They were sharing land. Uh, they were disagreeing. We know that at least 18 years of direct oppression from the Moabites to the Israelites, we know uh, about a religion that includes infant sacrifices. And we know that at one time, a king of Moab named Balak decided that he was going to hire um, a prophet, kind of a prophet for hire actually, to come and curse Israel. And so Balaam was riding this donkey and there was an angel of death waiting for him and his donkey could see it and he couldn't. And so the donkey turns away and Balaam refocuses the donkey and the donkey turns away and and Balaam more forcefully refocuses the donkey on the road ahead and then finally Balaam and his donkey have a conversation and Balaam and the donkey kind of wins the conversation and um, we know that there's just this weird history between Moab and Israel and so including Moab as, a, as the, the spot where Ruth came from as the great grandmother great grandmother of David would be really strange. Now, as we're talking about that, last week ended on a cliffhanger. Boaz had declared that he was going to take care of the situation. And so at the end of that book, Ruth goes back to Naomi. And I really like Boaz, he's going to take care of it today. And Ruth in 3:18. Says the, uh, Naomi says this to Ruth, and then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. So we believe that it's that day, the day after the threshing floor, that Boaz gets up and goes to the city center. Now, I, I just got back uh, late last night from the men's retreat, and uh, there was a lot of snacks there, um, a lot of snacks. So when Lupina says the, the, the men were not good, no, they weren't. There was a lot of calories consumed, a lot of empty calories consumed. But some of the things that we're talking about uh, are manly things. Um, and we're talking about manly maxims, actually, from this book that we read one time, that I read one time, actually. And uh, maxim number one in this book of uh, Mansfield's book of manly men is that manly men do manly things. That men are men of actions. Words have power. But great men are made by actions. Great words make great authors, make great lyricists, but great men are men of action. And that's what we see Boaz doing, not just talking, but doing something. Now, one of the reasons we know Boaz's name, and in this story, there's this guy who's made up, and we just call him the kinsman redeemer or the guardian redeemer, is because he doesn't do anything. We remember men's names when they do something. We know Boaz. We don't know the guardian redeemer because he doesn't do what a guardian redeemer is supposed to do. It's really kind of ironic that we call him the guardian redeemer when he doesn't guardian or redeem anything. He lets Boaz do it. But Boaz was a man on a mission. And he went directly to the city center. And and this is kind of a disagreement between scholars, whether this was just happenstance, 
that the, the elders of the community, uh, ten, in fact, were there, and the guardian redeemer just happened to be there, or, be there, or if Boaz kind of orchestrated the entire thing. That he was able to figure out a spot where everybody was going to be and just made sure that everybody came together. Now, the laws that we're talking about here, the, the law that is Ruth and the land, is called the law of leverate marriage. Now, I want to read this to you because it, it feels very legal and I want to make sure I get it right. <clears throat> the law of leverate marriage is Moses instructed the Israelites in Deuteronomy that when brothers live together and one of them dies and has no sons, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as a wife and perform the duty as a husband brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall, uh, shall assume the name of the dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out from Israel. That's Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6. So when Imelech died, the property went to Malon, and when Malon died, the property then included the widow Ruth. She was now part of the redemption responsibility, and the property will go to any son born to her to perpetuate the family line. In other words, the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, was needed to buy the land and take Ruth as wife to carry on the name of Ruth's husband, and by extension, Elimelech's name would continue. So that's the law, this law that feels really strange to us because it's not part of our culture, but it was the culture of the, at the time of the judges. And so we see this happening. But there's benefits to being a kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer is usually a patriarch of the family, but there were things that were good. It wasn't just all responsibility. You see, if you had a field that you had redeemed, all the profits from that field, all the harvest and all the grain that you took were yours until the son was old enough to claim it. So at least 13 years of profits that you could do you could have into yourself. So Boaz brings everybody together. Now there's just this little fun fact here. In, in the Jewish culture, even until today, to have a full prayer circle, you need 10 men. To have a full Jewish men's prayer circle, it requires 10 men. Some people point to these 10 elders that Boaz brought together. Saying that if, if 10 men are enough, then it's the, at least enough for a minimum amount of the prayer circle. So this is how much culture is being pulled forward by this interaction. And so Boaz challenges this kin's redeemer. And I see Boaz here kind of being smart and crafty. He lists out all the good parts. Hey, here's all the land, uh, and you can redeem the Elimelech. And Malon, you can do all these great things. And the kinsman redeemer agrees. And then at the end, Boaz kind of plays uh, the card and, and kind of says the one thing. And he includes that Ruth is a Moabite. That, oh, when you redeem this land, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, as your wife. My thoughts on this is, is Boaz was a, a crafty enough businessman that he knew what he wanted. And so got the kinsman redeemer to agree to something, and then at the end was able to add on the thing that he knew the kinsman redeemer would not like. Now, the thing you should know is that Boaz and the kinsman redeemer were relatives. At the very least, they were cousins. They were most likely brothers. And so he knows this guy. He knows him well enough to know that it probably won't work. And the kinsman redeemer decides that he's not going to do it. I can't do it. And he says something because it'll mess up the inheritance. So what we're assuming here is that because Ruth was a Moabite or because if there's any other children uh, that he has with Ruth that will, can be on his side of the inheritance, that he has plans for his descendants and they don't include any more kids, so he's gonna, they're going to mess that up. So then he also sees that Boaz is transparent enough 
that he, that Boaz has a desire here, wants to redeem Ruth. So the kinsman redeemer agrees, takes off his shoe and hands it to Boaz, which is really weird. But that's like the signature at the end of a contract. That basically means that our dealings are done. And so as soon as Boaz had that sandal in his hand, he realized that he got what he wanted and he had fulfilled all the promises that he had made to Ruth the night before. What's funny is that they spent a lot of time talking about Boaz and this kinsman redeemer. The whole rest of the book is just a few verses long. Because it says that Boaz and Ruth were married, that they had a kid. And the kid was given to Naomi to raise as kind of his nanny. And she named him Obed. And at the end of the book, it talks about how Obed was the father of... Obed was a great-grandfather was a grandfather of David. So Obed's son was Jesse, and Jesse's son was David. And David would become king of Israel. Again, making this look a lot like a political story. But what we have is the entire book of Ruth. The entire book of Ruth, which starts with famine and death and Naomi losing her sons and her husband and being in a foreign land and being destitute and ends with new life, a new baby, a new family for her to care for and to love and one that will go on to do amazing and great things in the nation of Israel. Now this sermon is called Boaz and the Kinsman Redeemer. But when I'm talking about the Kinsman Redeemer, I'm not talking about the guy who didn't do Kinsman or Redeeming. I'm talking about something else. Because while this looks like a political origin story, I believe it's something else. I believe it's an it's a, it's a, it's a advertisement, it's a prequel. It's a story that points to another story. This story begins with death and ends with life. I believe that it is an origin story, but it's an origin story for our relationship with Christ. That this is the story of Boaz redeeming the unredeemable and Naomi finding life in this story. Now one of the, the verses that people quote all the time is Romans 3.23. And that says, For all have sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. It's easy to remember that when it's short, it's succinct, it's kind of mean. Let's go on to the next verse, verse 24, which we forget it. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That word redemption is what I want you to focus on. That word redemption shares the entomology with Goel the kinsman redeemer, the one who buys back, the one who purchases back. This is a lovely story, but it's not a romance. It's a story about who Christ is to us. It's a prequel that lets us know that when Christ came, he is our kinsman redeemer. This is the story that points to Christ, one of many in the Old Testament. I want to end with this story. This boy and his father made a toy boat. They cut the wood, they crafted, they pieced it together, they sanded it, they painted it, and he laced the sails. And it was his son's favorite toy. And he lived close to a lake and he tied a rope to it and he would push it out or let the waves and the wind carry it out. And then he just kind of pull it back in with the rope and he'd do it again. And he loved doing it. And then one day the rope broke. And so the, the toy boats went away on the lake and the winds and the waves took it beyond the reach of the child. He was really sad. A couple weeks later he was walking uh, in the downtown area of 
the little town by the lake. And he looked into a secondhand shop window and he saw his boat. And so he walked in and he told uh, the manager, hey, that's my boat. Me and my father made it. If you look underneath it, my name's on it. And the secondhand shop kind of giggled to himself. He says, that's lovely. But um, I don't want to just say finders keepers, but finders keepers. But I'll sell it to you for 50 bucks. It's great craftsmanship. 50 bucks is fine. Well, the kid said, okay, hold it for me. And he goes home, empties his piggy bank, doesn't have 50 bucks. So he mows yards. He rakes leaves. Any chores he can do, he'll do. Saves every penny, doesn't spend any on anything else. No comics, no candy. Well before the month was over, he goes back into the store and pays the 50 bucks. Walks out with a boat that him and his father made. And he holds it close. He says, I own you twice now. I made you. I lost you. And now I have purchased you back. Now that's the story of our lives and the God who made us and the God who redeemed us. It's a story that points to Christ just like the story of Boaz and Ruth points to Christ. A story that begins with death and ends with life. Would you bow your heads with me?